So what is desirable in a representation? The first one is you can say there's an entangling, a disentangling objective here. Where I, what I want is that similar stimuli produce similar representations because that makes, uh, makes learning the final recognition much better then. The second one is I want it to be predictive of the future world. A good representation allows us to predict what happens around us. We want the representation to be predictive of other parts of the world. What I currently see should tell me something about what happens in other areas. I want representations to be cheap to compute. I want them to allow for compositionality. I can say represent the world in terms of the objects that are here. And I also might want a representation to be able to causally represent the world. Now, some of these features are very complicated. But many of them can be used for the training of representations in an unsupervised way. And as we shall see, um, the representation induced by ConvNet have many of these desirable properties. Not all of them though. So what is a convolutional neural network? And I want to say here that I will be using the way that Brandon Rora is using this description. And uh, he was so nice to give me the permission to use his slides for that. So what is a confnet? Uh, what we have is it's a, it's a regular supervised learning setting. Now we have a two-dimensional array of pixels, goes into the confnet, output is, oh, this is an X on O, a classification on the output. Now what's the setting? We might have uh, patterns like the upper one, which is an X, which we want mapped into the label X, and others like that little ball that we see at the bottom left, that we might want to have mapped into an O. Now, in a way, this seems an easy problem until we start thinking about the properties of the visual world. So we have that X. Clearly, that stimulus that I show you here on the left-hand side is very similar to what the one that I show you on the right-hand side. In fact, it's just a tiny rotation between the two of them. And what we'd like to do is have a system that can represent that what we have on the left is similar to what we have on the right. And the question is how we can do such a thing. Now, how could we look at similarity? Well, we can just look at how similar those two are point by point. It turns out that these two stimuli here if we look at the pixels, there are more pixels where they're different than there's pixels where they're the same. And yet, clearly for us, they're perceptually very similar, whereas a naive comparison doesn't reveal that similarity. So how could we have a system that allows us to know that these two very different images in a way are very similar? Well, convnets are the trick that we to, uh, do for that. So let's have the intuition here. So we have these two stimuli. Locally, they are very similar. Look here, the, the green box here reappears here in this part. And the orange box here reappears in this part. And the violet box reappears in this part. Now, in a way, this is already the intuition that drives much of confnets. No, what I want is a representation that somehow locally detects that there's an edge in the green case or that there's a crossing in the orange case and then represents that if these things are moved a little relative to one another, it's still kind of the same image. So the question is how could we could implement something like that. How could local features look like? Here's three possibilities. Now we have one feature here that has one diagonal. Here we have the checkerboard pattern. Here we have another diagonal. Now what we want to do is we want to detect such a feature in that image. And here we can do it by eye. You know, like yeah here it fits. It also perfectly fits here. So let's now implement something that does this kind of a search. So how can we locally ask how similar the feature is to the local patch of the image? We take, so we take that local patch here, and if you want, we apply it to the image in these areas. Now they are the same size. And then we calculate how similar they are. Where we have here is one, we multiply it with the one here, 
gives us a 1 as a result. And then we write this into the multiplication of them. No, we just pointwise multiply those vectors. And then we can do it for all locations. It's always the same. It's either 1 times 1 or minus 1 times minus 1. So it gives us 9. And now we want to normalize that, where we can say the result of local filtering is 9 times the 1 that we have, which is that they always agree with one another, divided by 9, just for normalization, giving us the value 1 here. And then what we can do is we can define this in uh, at other locations. Now we can say, well, what if we apply this thing here right in the middle? Well, let's see. Uh, this thing applied to the middle will agree in these seven spots here, and it will disagree in, in these two. And therefore, what we have is 9 uh, uh, is 7 times the plus minus 2 times the minus. It's 5 ninths, and therefore we'd write 0. 0.55 into the result of the convolution here. And then we do this for all possible locations. And now when I say all possible locations, look what's happening there. This location, I didn't. Why didn't I do it? Because it goes outside of the image. Outside of the image, it wouldn't be defined. We'll talk about padding, which solves that problem in just a second. But we apply this to every possible location on the inside, giving us this as a result. So this is the result of the convolution. Now, what does it tell us? It basically means that feature here is very strongly present here and here and here and here, somewhat present in certain other places, and really not present anywhere in those areas. And um, now let's do a convolution exercises by hand. Now, like I said, it's always nice to do these things by hand to have good intuitions. So I want to convolve this thing here with this thing. How would I do this? I take this upper left pattern here, multiplied with this. What do we have? We have three ones here times three, giving us three. And here we have two non-zeros here that each see a minus one and a uh, minus one half. So we have three minus two over two. So we're gonna get a two in this case. And then we can apply it on the right-hand side. What's different here is we have only one one and we have six minus one half, so we get minus 3 plus 1, so we're going to get a minus 2. We're going to do that, uh, that same operation here, giving us a minus 1, and that same operation in the lower right, giving us a plus 1. This is if we do convolution by hand. Now, in practice, you will never do convolution again by hand. That's why we have an exercise to give you the chance to do it by hand, just so that you get the intuition you will see that convnets and convolutions are so common in deep learning that I really want to make sure that you have an intuition on how exactly they work.